I'm uh, Chris Wolf. I'm the head of AI and advanced services at VMware by Broadcom. And so I, I think this is probably stating the obvious for a lot. This is uh, no surprise here. We've had these like mega shifts in terms of app innovation over the years from PC applications, really opening up doors and, and new opportunities for all of us uh, to business productivity, to, to web applications, really starting to change the game. And then there's mobile applications where I don't know, probably 80% of my personal stuff I'm doing on a mobile phone, at least. Maybe, maybe it's probably even higher than that. And, and now we're seeing this rise of AI applications, which is going to be just as equally impactful um, as we move forward. And AI, it's not new, right? We've had organizations that you know, I've worked with for decades now that have been doing AI. This is not new. There's been a lot of usage of specialized AI models uh, for things like fraud detection for a very, very long time. And because of that, you look at organizations that uh, have AI expertise already, such as in financial services, they were able to very quickly start to move into generative AI uh, with, with large language models. And there's a ton of use cases here uh, that you see across lots of different industries, you know, even VMware, as an example for marketing is, was one of our early use cases where we were using SaaS based AI services to create some of our marketing content. And we've used two different companies for that and we found it to be very effective uh, for us as, as one of our early uh, areas of, of moving forward. Uh, we've also done some work in software development. Uh, we're, you're, we're starting to see more use cases come forward and we will have a session as a part of the series that's gonna go through in, in technical detail, uh, the architecture of the VMware services. Now, if you look at the McKinsey numbers for what is the annual potential academic or economic value for generative AI, and it's looking to be uh, in the neighborhood of $4.4 trillion. So it, we all know that this is a huge opportunity for uh, really for the industry as it starts to change, uh, transform. Is that next year or? I, I think it's gonna, it's gonna take some time for, for sure. Um, and, it, you know, there's, there, when you start to look at the AI ecosystem, this is, this is applications, this is mobile devices, this is data services, right? This is compute infrastructure. Uh, there's certainly a, a very large representative, uh, representation there. Plus, you have all of the uh, derived business value that's, that's coming from generative AI, right, as, as, a, as a part of all of this. Uh, so so there's, it's going to take some time to, to evolve. However, uh, we are seeing uh, early adopters already in, in places that I would say might be surprising, like uh, the country of Japan is a good example. Uh, Japan historically is a more conservative type of uh, IT type of uh, you know, landscape. However, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, early traction in Japan for AI use cases. And, and there was a president of one of the companies that we're working with came out to visit us last month. And I asked him, I said, why? Why Japan? And, and he said something that was really pretty interesting. He said, the, the government of Japan is investing in AI because for decades, the population of Japan has been shrinking. And Japan as a nation feels that the only way to stay competitive globally is going to be through artificial intelligence because they won't have enough people. And I was like, wow, that's really, really quite profound. And because of that, the, the government of Japan is investing a lot in terms of helping to bootstrap uh, AI projects across the industries uh, in the country, which I think is pretty exciting. So that was a, that was a that was probably one of the earlier aha moments uh, for us when we're seeing this, but we're seeing it we're seeing traction picking up in the U.S. and Europe and and lots of other places too. Yeah. So tying it back to your slide that you're showing here, do you see geographic trends that are showing differences across the use use case? You mentioned Japan. You just you mentioned a specific use case uh, in Japan, but what about other trends across the world? Yeah, so that's it's a good question. Uh, another trend that we're seeing probably a little more consistently in, in different parts of the world is around sovereignty. So this is also part of, as I'll talk through our private AI, uh, our thoughts on private AI, is there's a lot of governments now that are stepping up in terms of having uh, uh, you know, normalization around what are, what are AI ethics and what are good, good usage. You're seeing that in the European Union. Um, in the United States, you know, NIST has published some guidelines as well. So there's starting to be a little bit more maturity there and then there are sectors that are fairly consistent globally, right? Like retail has been using computer vision for years now around theft detection at self-checkout. But I, there's, there's, there's more innovation happening in retail, which I think is also pretty cool. There's a retail I worked with uh, late last year, and they run uh, their AI footprint on a VMware stack in all of their stores. 
And their, their key application, which I think is pretty exciting, is what they're looking for is, this is a computer vision app, but they're looking, they have cameras in their aisles. And they're looking for somebody spending too much time in an aisle. Because it means that most likely that person needs help. Like me in the plumbing section at a home improvement store, right? I'm going to just stare at this rack of like plumbing adapters because I don't want to come back, right? I want to get it right the first time. So I'm that, I'm that target type of candidate. So what the way that the tech works is uh, it's running on a couple of VX rails, so it's locally, so you don't have any type of latency for the inference. It will send, a, it will send a, basically a, an associate a text. So they all carry mobile phones. They'll get what they call a nudge, and it'll, the text will tell them what aisle to go to, and then they'll find the customer and help them out. They have measured the impact. So the stores that have this technology, there is a material impact on sales in those stores that they can measure. So there's a true ROI for the technology, uh, which is also pretty exciting. So it's, it's starting to pick up. There's a lot of kicking the tires in a, in a, in a lot of different uh, sectors. But you know, common use cases we are seeing is things like customer service, um, enterprise knowledge search, where I have a lot of internal documentation, whether that's sales contracts or legal data, uh, things of that nature, uh, those are all really picking up and, and gaining steam. Okay, so, so on that privacy narrative, you know, where we're seeing uh, concerns around artificial intelligence is around privacy. And, and these are, these are some, somewhat complicated things. I want to protect my IP. I don't want my IP used to help train a model that benefits a competitor. Common, common concern. But along my IP, and you think about this in the context of marketing materials, a, a retail CIO shared this with me not too long ago, where he said, you know, I was using a SaaS-based AI service for my customer demand gen emails. And I got an email from one of my competitors, and it used the exact same language as my emails. And that told me that they're using the same AI service as me. <laughs> so what they said was, we have, to, we have to step back and we have to think differently about this. We want to be able to use our historical data, how we've communicated with customers. We want to fine tune a model based on that data so that our voice is captured in our communications. You know, practical consideration for how to, how to private, uh, keep things private. In VMware's context, our key intellectual property is our source code. So we wanted to make sure that anything we did around code development was gonna make sure that the privacy of our source code was, was maintained. And that led us to uh, using open source technologies such as StarCoder. You know, keeping data privacy, not sharing it externally, this is uh, happening with, uh, in terms of data sovereignty requirements that governments are uh, handing out. It's a key concern of customers, because I want to contain, I want to maintain the control of the data. I don't want to have to convert my data into somebody's proprietary data format in order to take benefit of AI, because what if something better comes along? How much harder is it going to be for me to pivot? How much more will it cost me uh, to do those things? And then access control is a really tough one. And I would say we're not there yet in terms of where the technology needs to be. To give you an example, it's, it's very easy to take a, to run a software that uses elevated privileges to collect data to start to uh, populate a vector database for uh, use cases like retrieval augmented generation. So search-based use cases for generative AI. The problem is if I collect data using elevated privileges and then somebody else with a lower set of privileges now starts to run queries against the model, you've just created a backdoor. Right? Very, very easy to do these types of things. So in practice, what we're seeing, like in, say, in the U.S. federal government, if I have different security clearances or different security clearance levels, I have to have different models for each one. I, I, can't, I can't even run the risk of any type of data poisoning within the same model or within the same even chat interface. So this has led us to, to private AI, and VMware is not going to claim that this is something we invented. We didn't. This is... Uh, this has been around for some time. Microsoft Research, as an example, was talking about private AI way back in 2017. Uh, we feel this is, a, this is an industry approach. Uh, it doesn't have to even include uh, private cloud. I can run private AI in a virtual private cloud on AWS. It just means that I'm, make, I'm maintaining uh, both the business gains of AI with the privacy and compliance needs of the organization. So I want to maintain data control, data privacy, ensure that I'm meeting my compliance mandates, so that's what's important. So Chris, uh, just back to the point you made on access control. Uh, you mentioned that there are separate models to you know, be at effectively equivalent to whatever privilege level that particular model data is. Uh, so they're all being trained at the level of whatever access rights. So you're, you're training multiple models, you're, you're doing inferencing across multiple models and all that stuff. Is that how this is working for those companies that have multiple levels like intelligence services and stuff like that? You, that's, that's, that's the practical way that, that 
uh, these companies are looking at it today, but it is a lot of tire kicking because there's just a lot of fear of the unknown. But that's, that's, the, that's the only, it's the way I, like a lot of you have been in these, these spaces for a long time. So if you think about the very early days when virtualization was a disruptor, the, the concern that organizations started to have was like their PCI compliant workloads as an example. So the way the problem was addressed to make sure I can pass a compliance audit was you put your PCI compliance uh, workloads on a dedicated physical cluster. I did just physically isolate it for that compliance use case. And we're seeing the same type of approach with AI. It's, it's, it's overly conservative, but organizations don't want to have you know, something really run amok. So that's the, that's the thought behind that. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I, uh, just to stay on track here, there's a couple other points I just wanna make around private AI in general, then I'm gonna uh, move into another presentation on uh, the VMware approach and what VMware is doing specifically. So areas besides privacy that we think are really important is gonna be choice. That means choice of software you can run above the platform, as well as choice of hardware that I might use as different AI accelerators. And this is really important because you are seeing these vertically integrated solutions where it's like one AI set of models, one software stack, and one all the way down to the hardware stack. We think that's entirely unrealistic. You gotta be able to maintain the ability to go best of breed. You should be able to, there's lots of different software spaces that are more vertically oriented or use case oriented. You should be able to take advantage of those and not just lock yourself into a single vertical stack. Um, cost is really important. What we're seeing around private AI is uh, you can be as little as a third the cost of some of the public AI services that are out there today. We've done the benchmarks. We're working with a third party to uh, produce some data on this that's, that's going to validate this. or maybe even adjust some of our own assumptions, but uh, when you can start to bring some of your own cost optimizations around AI infrastructure and keep them in your pocket, there's a, there's a lot of money to be saved there. Uh, performance is equally important, so that's in any use case, whether it's virtual or, or non-virtual, and of course, we have to be able to meet our compliance needs. I mentioned some of the common Chris, use cases already. Chris, one question yeah. on that, Yep, on that last one. Um, you said you think it's important. Is that something you're hearing from customers as demand, or is that an opinion of VMwares that you're thought leading the industry with? But I think, are you, t performance, is that? No, all of those. Yeah, no, this is, we validated this with customers. So uh, when we started forming our strategy, we went out, we worked, we worked on a VMware basis with 40 different customers that were already, uh, had various AI use cases. We were typically talking to the chief data officer. Uh, or if they didn't have that role, it would be like the CTO or somebody like that on their directs. Um, we then also used a third party that went out and, and talked with 200 different customers about these, these needs. And so we were able to aggregate the data and that's how we were able to uh, uh, arrive at you know, that, that initial position that we had. And we've just continued to iterate on it. Okay. Right. And it's all coming from your current customer base? Uh, not, not even VMware customers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's really important because that's where you start to get some confirmation bias when you're only talking to your existing customers. Got it. So uh, we, we approach innovation from a perspective of absolute paranoia, wondering what we're not thinking about. And that's really helped us, I, I think, over the last several years to get a lot of things right the first time uh, because we do so much validation with just the industry, not necessarily just with VMware customers to ensure are we on the right track or not. And if we're not, then we're, we're not afraid to shut something down or pivot. Okay, uh, uh, contact center resolution, everybody has this use case. Everybody wants to reduce the calls to their support teams or their help desks. There's clear business value here. Uh, and, and a large language model can, can arrive at fairly significant results. Uh, the, the language model that VMware runs internally, uh, we, we wind up seeing uh, the ability to get queries against internal documentation, wikis, uh, even uh, creating code samples for you around different ways to integrate different products and things like that. And that's all driven through an open source language model. Okay, uh, typical workflow, uh, choosing an LLM, fine tuning it with domain specific data. We think there's gonna be a lot of traction here where you're gonna start to see more language models that are industry specific. You even look at some of Google's new architecture, that's how they're starting to do this. They're having a top level model that's then sending requests to different more domain specific oriented models to get faster and more accurate results. Uh, and then we can deploy that LLM for inferencing. And this is really important because a lot of the times the, the AI conversation focuses on training. And the, the thought is you have to have, uh, you know, tens to hundreds to thousands of GPUs to do anything with AI. And it's just not true. Uh, we were able to fine tune a model using two A100s as an example, and it took us half a day. Uh, when we're running inferencing workloads, we're often using a fraction of a GPU. And this is where technologies like virtualization really start to matter. Um, and inferencing is what you're doing 24 seven. That's the constant workload. So you don't want to focus your entire architecture on training when that's only something you're going to do periodically. Hey, Chris, can you, can you kind of 
tell me the distinction between fine tuning and uh, the context uh, window uh, vector database uh, rag kind of solutions that, that are out there. So is fine tuning different than yeah rag? yeah I can uh, yeah so with retrieval augmented generation I don't have to fine tune a model at all. I, I can we can use a base model that's using like uh, we're, we're using um, uh, Wizard LM is one of the open source models we've used and with a, enough parameters the model is going to be able to uh, create effective queries uh, to be able to uh, then uh, draw from a database. So RAG is going to also use a vector database. So I have similarities of, of groups of objects, right, that are stored in the database that can help the model ascertain what you're looking for. And then in typically a RAG architecture, you're going to, when you get that result, you're also, and this is how the VMware internal engine works, is you're going to get uh, links or references to how the model actually arrived at that answer. So RAG actually, it really simplifies the entire story because I don't need a whole lot of expertise to, to actually set up and, and gain the value and the benefits of AI. It's one of the use cases that us as a company are focused on predominantly because anybody in the industry has a, has a use case for RAG. So what you're saying is RAG and, and fine tuning are sort of uh, complement, uh, you know, Opposites, effectively, one can can take place of the other. You can certainly you can certainly t use a fine tuned model with RAG, but you don't have to. Is, I see. is how I'd say it. Okay, last things to think about. So I talked about some of these areas when you're thinking about choosing the right private AI solution. The last thing I would leave everybody with is adaptability. So you, the space is moving too quick. You, you can't just put yourself into a solution that doesn't that limits your flexibility, flexibility of your data, flexibility of your control flexibility of the models you might want to use, whether it's commercial from ISVs or whether it's open source uh, or whether it's cloud, right? You should be able to have an adaptable solution. That's something that we think is really important. It's part of our own internal use case and we're seeing this as a key requirement with customers. Uh, here's some links uh, that'll be part of the, the PDF that's shared uh, that can help you get to some of the more of the uh, uh, VMware resources that are out there, uh, starting with our AI homepage to some blog articles and, and some webinars as well. So be sure to check them out. Thank you very much. I've got one, one question we can finish actually. Um, can you give us a brief overview of how technically it's implemented, like how are the models serve? Um, are you leveraging you know, the virtualiz virtualization support for something like an NVIDIA GPU? What does the interface look like? Is how, that, how, how does that work? work? Yeah, it's, um, there's not, there's not going to be one answer. So I can use like the NVIDIA Nemo software uh, for model serving. Uh, that's, that's one approach that, uh, that customers use. There's a lot of uh, MLOps uh, tools that customers would use as well. So they, many of them are uh, VMware ecosystem partners. Uh, we're doing a, we're doing a lot of our own work as well to provide some of that uh, some of those capabilities organically uh, within the stack. Uh, so and, and then there's uh, there's the partners we're working with as well. So I can use IBM Watson X for for model serving and management as well, running on top of our stack. So uh, where we're focused is, um, and I'll, I'll cover this as well uh, in the next session is we're focused on where we add value to the ecosystem. Uh, and, and we're looking to partner further up stack because we don't have to solve everybody's problems. And, and actually, our partners prefer it that way because we're not direct competitors with them. We, we have clear value on, on, in what we're trying to focus on. So you're really looking at virtual, uh, specializing still at that virtualization of the GPU resources or CPU resources or whatever it might be. Memory, networks, yep, yep, all those things. Layering whatever software stack or VMs or whatever it might be on top. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. To build on.